Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, July 11th, 2024. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Chris Colby, author of the Homebrew Recipe Bible, Methods of Modern Homebrewing, and How to Make Hard Seltzer, joins me to taste my fruit stout pasteurization experiment and to help me formulate the recipe for an American malt liquor, the latest mash your luck recipe challenge. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basic brewing. And many thanks to everybody who was helping out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basic brewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. And many thanks to the new Patreon subscribers who are signing up every week. Your help is very much appreciated. Steve and I were able to get together to shoot a couple of video episodes this week, so financial subscribers will get to see those first, along with recipes and bonus videos. According to my calculations, this is show number 900 of Basic Brewing Radio. And since the first episode of Basic Brewing Radio was posted on July 14th, 2005, next week we'll be entering our 20th year of podcasting. I say all the time that I thought we'd run out of things to talk about after show number 10, <laughs> but but thanks to your ideas and participation of many, many contributors, we're still going strong. And I've got lots of stuff on the whiteboard up here in the studio uh, for the coming weeks. Lots of good stuff coming your way. Many thanks to everybody who has helped in many ways to help keep this little venture alive. I took last week off from posting the show because Susan and I went on vacation in Milwaukee. And many thanks to uh, everybody who sent in uh, uh, suggestions of uh, places to go while we were there. Uh, months ago, she randomly picked Milwaukee because she was hoping it would be cooler up there weather-wise, and it was, and uh, we'd never been before. Turns out Milwaukee's great. We explored the historic Third Ward on foot mostly, spent a half day at the incredible Milwaukee Art Museum. I, I still I don't think we saw all of the stuff that's in there. Just incredible. Took a boat tour down the Milwaukee River and into Lake Michigan, watched fireworks from a rooftop. Man, what a great trip. Uh, we explored the public market. We had great beers and apps at the Wicked Hop. Uh, wonderful Belgian beers at Benelux, which I kept calling Dokalax because I couldn't remember the name. And boy, did Susan love that joke. Uh, <laughs> Adam Ross from Twin Span Brewing came over from Iowa to join us on Friday, and it was a lot of fun to spend time with him in person. Uh, Adam went with us to the Lakefront Brewery Tour, and you can see Adam and me uh, we were selected to put the ceremonial gloves on the on the bottles uh, at the end of the tour in a video. You can see that on a, in a video that I posted on Instagram, and you can see me uh, getting yelled at at the end of the video because I kept singing the Laverne and Shirley theme song when I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> Hope ASCAP or BMI doesn't uh, see that. Uh, one of my favorite stops was at Super Moon Beer Company which is this tiny brewery set in a house in a Milwaukee neighborhood. And I had one of the best triples I think I've ever had there. It was wonderful. Uh, it turns out Rob Brennan, owner and brewer, has been a listener of the show since 2009. And we're working together to uh, get him on the podcast. And uh, hopefully I, I'll get a chance to taste some of his beers again. And share them with Steve. I'm hoping to do that as well. Really looking forward to that possibility. Such a great time. Susan said it's one of, if not her favorite cities that she's ever been to, uh, Milwaukee. It just such a surprise. Probably the least planned vacation we've ever taken as well. Usually, you know, Susan lines out things well in advance and it's kind of like, oh, my God, I'm on a schedule. This is not a vacation. This is work. But this time... Uh, we only made a couple of reservations ahead of time and just did things when we wanted to do them. I mean, that boat trip thing was just like we were having uh, tequilas. Uh, 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 <laughs> tequila didn't have much to do with it. But we were having a share in a flight of tequilas uh, downtown. And uh, she said, let's let's do a boat tour. And she bought the tickets online. There we went out on a boat under some bridges. Uh, it, Milwaukee is a great town to, uh, you know, just, just do stuff on the spur of the moment. 
Uh, check out check out Basic Brewing on Instagram for some photos and that crazy video from Lakefront. So before we left town, uh, I got a I got a brewing story that actually involves my stir plate <laughs> that started before we left town. Uh, I, ordered, I ordered ingredients for the beer that Chris and I are going to formulate in this episode, and I got my ingredients from Dave, uh, formerly of High Gravity, now at Small Batch Boutique in, in Broken Arrow. And Dave did a great job of packing everything up, including putting my package of L17 Harvest Imperial, L17 Harvest from our from our friends and sponsors at Imperial. He put that into an insulated packet with the cold pack. Well, the U.S. Postal Service uh, had other ideas. They kept my delivery at the regional distribution center for two extra days. You know, you were able to track it online, but, you know... Uh, <laughs> So you could tell exactly where your package is stuck. So when my order got to me, the ice was melted. The yeast packet wasn't, you know, it wasn't hot or swollen, uh, but, you know, I feared the worst. So I, I went ahead and made a two-liter starter, and I got it moving on the stir plate. But then we left town. Uh, so a couple of days later, I asked my son, Will, to send me a picture of the flask. And there wasn't a lot of, you know, bubbling around the, the edge of the, the top of the thing. Uh, not a lot of, uh, you know, activity evident, but uh, the starter was much lighter in color so that I knew that there was yeast growth. Uh, so when we got back into town, uh, I poured the beer off of that yeast, made another two-liter starter and put on top of that. And within two hours, it was boom. It was like a regular order of Imperial. It was like it looked like carbonated soda. I'm glad I put in, you know, a couple, three drops of a firm cap S or it would have been all over the place. So I knew I was back in business. So I'm I'm looking forward to brewing this weekend and pitching that rescued yeast. You know, Imperial Yeast takes great care in shipping their yeast. I've been at Steve's brew shop when he had the shop when he unpacked a shipment from Imperial and it it was super cold, super well packed. Uh, I've also gotten direct shipments directly from them. The yeast is always cold and, and well packaged so that your homebrew shop, you know, by the time it gets to your homebrew shop, it's well taken care of. And Dave did a great job in packaging this shipment to me. But, you know, if it was delivered on time, uh, it would have been fine. Uh, but, the again, the post office held on to it for an extra two days. And I was told that the, ship, the, the, that the shipping and the tracking on the website – that's just an estimate. <laughs> if it says it's going to be delivered by 7 o'clock on a certain day, eh, you know. <clears throat> anyway, with 200 billion cells in each easy-to-open package, my stir plate is usually dusty because I don't use it anymore for moderate gravity 5-gallon batches. In the next video episode, you'll, able to, you'll be able to see Steve and me taste uh, my really delicious 8.6% ABV double IPA that I brewed on the warm porch with a packet of A37 Pog with no starter. That thing was done in a jiffy. Uh, Pog is the seasonal yeast from Imperial. It's Ebbegarden Kvike. Uh, so it, it's the seasonal yeast through August. It's been extended. So, so get you some and take advantage of that summer heat to get some delicious tropical fruit flavors. Uh, ask your local homebrew store about A37 Pog and all the dependable deliciousness from Imperial Yeast. And check them out, as always, at imperialyeast.com. It's imperialyeast.com. Okay, long intro this week. I'm making up for lost time. You know, I didn't get to talk to you last week, so <laughs> but a lot of stuff happening. Uh, let's take a, or let's taste a fruit stout that's been pasteurized and strategize the recipe for an American malt liquor with Chris Colby. Chris Colby, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Hey, James. Thanks for having me on the show. Now, I, I could have sent you another... I, uh, <laughs> I might have sent you another bad beer. <laughs> or at least a beer you might not like. <laughs> I sent you other beers that I did like and you didn't. So uh, I'm trying to keep up my streak of, of sending you beers that you that you might not like. Um, if you remember, the last time we got together for a recipe development show, I wanted to do an experiment on pasteurizing beer, uh, yeah, and, and seeing if I could if I could design a beer 
that I could kind of back sweeten with fruit juice in the bottle and, right. and then let it, you know, bottle condition and carbonate using that fruit juice as the sugar source for the yeast and then stop that process, hopefully at, you know, near the, the proper uh, carbonation level with right. with pasteurization, with, with putting the beer in, an, in an, uh, a sous vide bath sort of. Uh, so what you got there in front of you is a Mr. Beer bottle that uh, apparently made it to you without blowing up, which is a good thing. Yep. Um, so so shall I shall I refresh people on the recipe and the and the process while you're sipping? I think you've you've already opened yours. Yeah, I poured it. So this is a very small batch. This I started out with three quarts or about three liters of water, and into that I I brought it up to 150 degrees Fahrenheit or 65 C. And into that, for 30 minutes, I steeped one ounce or 28 grams each of roasted barley, black malt, and special B. And then I took that out, and then I added in one pound or 450 grams of Pilsen light dry malt extract. And I brought that just up to the boil, and then I added one ounce or 28 grams of Willamette at 6.3% alpha acid, for a 10-minute steep, and that's all. Uh, and then I, I chilled it down, and then I added uh, a, a packet, a, a full packet of Safiel SO4, uh, and it fermented it out. Uh, it started out at 1074, finished at 1012 for an ABV of 8.2%, so it's pretty big. So mm -hmm. after the beer finished fermenting, I racked it into a Mr. Beer uh, fermenter, you know, the keg fermenter thing. And I added a quarter teaspoon of vanilla extract, and I was supposed to um, I was supposed to add the cacao nibs at uh, the steeping times with the grain, but I forgot. So what mm. I did was I made a tincture with uh, two ounces of uh, cacao nibs in half a cup of vodka, and uh, of that tincture, I added 15 milliliters uh, into the, the little keg, and then I had previously gotten 30 ounces or 850 grams of frozen blackberries. And I put that through the steam juicer and I got about two, two and a half or two and a quarter cups or 500 milliliters of juice. And I measured the bricks of that at uh, 1030. Uh, and what I did was I just put the whole thing. I put all of it into the uh, beer and the keg. Uh, because at first I was going to like taste it and, you know, kind of judge the sweetness and judge the fruit flavor. But I was like, ah, this is an experiment. I'll put it all in there. So I did and stirred that all up and then bottled. I got two of the giant, two and a half, about two and three quarters of the giant uh, Mr. Beer bottles, which are about, what, 25 ounces or something like that, I think I read. Uh, so then I let the, let those condition. And uh, see, after three days, I think it was, the the bottles uh, felt tight. And so I thought, well, you know, that's that's carbonation happening in there. So what I did was I put enough water in my uh, Warthog uh, uh, brew in a bag system uh, to, you know, cover the, the, the bottles essentially or enough to where they wouldn't float up off the bottom. Uh, and then I raised the... Um, that water temperature, I at 140 degrees Fahrenheit. My target was 145. So when it got up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, and I measured that, uh, I took a a bottle of water, the same kind of bottle, and I put water in it, and I put a, a thermometer into the water inside the bottle. So when that reached 140 degrees Fahrenheit, I started the timer, and so uh, and I I kept it in the hot water. For a hundred or for thirty minutes, it eventually got up to one hundred and forty-five degrees Fahrenheit. So one hundred and forty degrees Fahrenheit is sixty C. One hundred and forty-five is sixty-two point eight. So I kept it at thirty minutes there to hopefully pasteurize it so that the yeast wouldn't eat any more of the sugar and create bottle bombs. Uh, and I let them sit in. I put them in a garbage bag <laughs> and put them in the bathtub in the spare bedroom and crossed my fingers and. Uh, you know, none of them blew up, so I packaged uh, one of them up and sent it to you. And that's the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. So, uh, 
I'm gonna I'm gonna open mine. Oh, we got a fizz. We got we got some hiss, and I'll pour mine aggressively. It's it's not clear at all, which I kind of expected. There's not there's not a whole lot of there's not a whole lot of carbonation. What are you experiencing, Chris? Yeah, this one didn't carbonate uh, a a lot. There was it, it hissed when I opened it, and, and uh, like a, a very little bit of foam sort of ringed it. But yeah, it's fairly uh, a little bit low on the carbonation. I mean, trying to yeah, I mean, trying to to guesstimate it by a bottle uh, tension. <laughs> Why not? It's not the most scientific thing in the world. Com- commercial brewers <laughs> don't do it that way. <laughs> But but we've proven at least one point in that you can you can get carbonation up to a point and you can stop it. Yeah. Through pasteurization. And I'm tasting it and I and it tastes pretty sweet. So I think that there's there's residual sugars in there that weren't eaten up by the yeast. Would you agree? Oh yeah, there's a definite sweetness. The uh the fruit comes through uh very strongly. Um and I think it's you know accentuated by the uh, uh, vanilla in it, mm-hmm. um, yeah, because the the fruit character is good. It's not what I would call a well crafted beer. <laughs> it's not something I would enter into a competition, but it's got it's got some it's got some good flavor notes. I think uh, it is definitely under carbonated. I think it would be it would benefit from being uh, carbonated a bit more. Yeah, but I'm definitely tasting the fruit notes. Uh, from the uh, from the blackberry juice, um, and I th- I'm getting a little bit of the cocoa, like the cacao nibs. Yes, definitely. I think, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I think that tincture did very well. Um, and then after I after I made that tincture, I looked in the cabinet, and there's an old bottle of creme de creme de cacao hmm. in there, and and I smelled it, and I tasted a little bit of it, and I was like, man, that tastes pretty good. I bet I could have just used that. Uh, yeah, to flavor probably. the beer. Yeah, so next time I think I'll try that. But yeah, the the uh, the you can you can definitely it might be a little heavy on the vanilla. Even it's definitely a flavor component. Whereas a lot of times when you try when you you know add vanilla to something, you want it to kind of boost flavors rather than be you know right on its own. Might be it's a flavor. Right. If I was going to do this again, I would add more hops and more of the dark malt because, like, the the fruit character came out nicely, and it's sweet, which is what you know, which was the idea. Uh, but I could use a little more, like, roast m- mixing in with the uh, with with the chocolate flavor, and uh, and then just a little bit more uh, bitterness to offset the uh, the sweetness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, it definitely, it definitely needed, needs a, a little bit more bitterness, especially since it's such a sweet, uh, beer now, uh, with the, um, with the fruit juice added. Yeah. Um, it's not horrible though. I mean, no. you know, it's to the point where kind of, we're kind of nitpicking it instead of saying, "Ugh, this is awful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so at least there's that. <laughs> and did you say there's special B in this? Yeah. Either either I'm kidding myself or I can actually taste that. Oh, okay. So there's an ounce each uh, steeped of roasted barley, black malt, and special B. It's it's cloudy. Um, yeah. It, it looks milkshakey. Um, but again, it's an extract beer, um, you know, that wasn't boiled, uh, you know, if, as as a full boil. So I think I think as a as a test. Small batch test, uh, you know, first round. I think, I think, I think it accomplished the task. Uh, I mean, I th- in the show, I think I said, if you know, this could be an awful beer, uh, mm. uh, but it's not. It's not an awful beer. It, you know, it's okay. I wouldn't order a second one. <laughs> uh, but I think, you know, if 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 you were to scale up the recipe into a full size batch, if you were to to do you know, at least a thirty-minute boil uh, to get more, you know, uh, extraction of uh, you know IBUs, utilization of IBUs from the hops. Um, 
you know, if you were to balance the the dark grains better, um, you know, it, it would be a better it would be a better beer. Then you would then you would face the challenge of having a, a bunch more bottles to try to pasteurize, and that's what I, that's why I wanted to do the small batch was because I didn't want to have, you know, a whole bunch of these things to have to, you know, to pasteurize or clean up after after they blew up. <laughs> Right. Yeah, you could actually you you could start with this as as a base idea and move in a couple different directions. One, uh, the obvious, uh, more hops and more roasted barley, and have it be more like you know a stout with with some fruit in it. Or you could also basically forget about the forget about the roasted barley and just add more cacao nibs to have it just be more chocolatey along with the sweetness and the and the uh and the fruit and uh, you know i think the uh the vanilla comes through fine mm -hmm. or you could forget about almost all the dark stuff and just have it be a uh like a you know a fruit beer mm, yeah um yeah and dial it dial the dark grains down so it's you know uh turns out more you know uh like deep amber brown yeah, you could you could do a lot of things with this this initial idea. One thing that I didn't notice or I don't notice is is a cooked character to the fruit. You uh -oh. know, I think I think by by choosing that lower temperature, that 140 to 145 degrees Fahrenheit or 60 to 62 or 63 C, I think that it accomplishes the goal of stopping the fermentation without you know having a, without dulling the taste of the fruit, yeah, um, like sort of a jammy, uh, right, cooked. right, right, uh, or a darker, you know, fruit character. I think the fruit character is pretty bright. Uh, mm -hmm. it, t it tastes like fresh fruit. Uh, so, you know, I think that 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 was accomplished there. Um, the biggest challenge, I think, is measuring the carbonation level of the beer. Um, and I think you could do that more easily if you had if you had a bunch of bottles. Mm -hmm. uh, it, then what you could do is, you know, you get to like three or four days or whatever, and you feel it, and they're starting to tighten up. Uh, come on and tighten up. Uh, then you, uh, <laughs> mm. then you, uh, um, then you open one, you know, and see where you are. Yeah. And if you're, if, and if it's not enough then you let it go some more uh so i mean you're sacrificing beers at that point but if you've got more of them then that, that's yeah. not as much as big of a deal um you could also do them in you know standard glass you know 12 ounce bottles uh that's a bit more challenging in that it would take a longer time for the heat to go to transfer through the glass into the beer Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, where there's, whereas the PET is very thin, uh, you know, and it wasn't that wasn't that much of a challenge to to warm up the beer. Um, so, I mean, there you know, there are different ways that you can do it. Um, so, but I think that this experiment proved, or you know, gave us some data on how we could move forward if we wanted to create a back sweetened uh, beer. Uh, not using, you know. Also, you could you could use stabilizers as you do in mead or wine. Mm -hmm. uh, back sweeten a beer, uh, pressure uh, carbonate it in a keg, and then bottle off the keg. Uh, you know that's maybe the easier way to do it. <laughs> what are your main main takeaways? Uh, the fruit came out really nice. Uh, like you said, that it's a it's, it tastes like fresh fruit that there's, there's a refreshing acidity, acidity to it. Um, I mean, and, and the sweetness came through, so you definitely stopped the, the fermentation, uh, by pasteurization, uh, you know, it, so that part worked and yeah, basically it's, you know, for a, a stab in the dark recipe with a, with an unusual procedural step, you know, it yields the, drinkable beer and you know uh uh i you know hypotheses for how to uh how to improve it yeah so successful experiment i'd say sure <laughs>
And it's 8.2%. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So Chris will be happy the rest of the afternoon if he finishes that big old beer. <laughs> we, yeah, I'll be making a lot of sense on the rest of the podcast. <laughs> yeah, we better get we better get to the recipe formulation before the, <laughs> before this beer kicks in. <laughs> oh well, yay! You didn't you, you didn't uh, you didn't make a, you didn't make an audible face and uh, you know say it was mm. horrible. So yay! <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, I got together a few days ago with Adam Ross and Scott Housel, uh, and we uh, tasted a couple of Scott's beers, which are very good. Uh, and we did a sort of impromptu uh, mash your luck episode where we spun the dial and we p- we picked out um, uh, character characteristics for a beer uh, recipe that I hope that you'll that you'll help me with today. The characteristics are high ABV, so not very high ABV, but high ABV, very high bitterness, gold, U.S. lager. Gold. (laughs) There's gold in in their bottles. (laughs) Sounds like an episode of (laughs) Scooby-Doo. Zoinks. Zoinks. (laughs) <laughs> uh look it's done nuts. <laughs> <laughs> so uh so th- what came to mind with you know Adam and Scott and I we said hey that sounds kind of like a malt liquor. <laughs> do you do you have any experience in in formulating a, a malt liquor or do you think there's another style that would fit you know on the in those uh, characteristics? James, 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 do I have any experience formulating <laughs> malt liquor? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you can ask me that. Yes, I, I've had some experience with that. I just throw you a softball. <laughs> Is there one in one of your books? Should I? Have, uh, actually, yeah. Should I have looked? <laughs> just read from your book and we'll be done. Let's drink. Yeah, there we go. We'll just drink I'll more just beer. I'll just get a page number and we'll be done. <laughs> yeah, then we'll just drink more beer. <laughs> uh, is it in uh, uh what's jeez what the homebrew recipe bible? Yeah, there's one in there. Now, what do you what when you think of malt liquor, what comes to mind? I mean, what are the characteristics of a of a malt liquor? And you know, I mean, does this sound like one? Uh, it sounds like it, except for the hops. I mean, uh, malt liquor is usually strong, um, strong, pale, fizzy. You know, it's it's like it. You know, it's it's. You know, basically, a, an American Pilsner just brewed stronger, um, depending on. Uh, some of them have a almost less barley character, like they're they're more of the adjunct in there. Other than the the hop bitterness, uh, that, I mean, that sounds like a pretty much directly a, a malt liquor. And and I looked up a couple of examples. Dogfish Head. A while back, did a liqueur de malt, <laughs> which <laughs> was their version. <laughs> I think it came in a forty ounce size with a paper bag, uh, and it was like seven percent ABV. And I found a recipe on uh, the uh, uh, Homebrew Association's Homebrewers Association's w- website from Charlie Papazian. It was mm-hmm. also seven percent ABV. Um, you know, back in the back in the day when I was in college, I think there was a law that said anything over five percent ABV had to be labeled a malt liquor, uh, at least in Arkansas. Um, so these days, seven percent ABV is 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 not considered as high as it used to be. Yeah, with the proliferation of you know double ipa is seven seven percent is almost nothing these days mm-hmm. or even just right just ipas um you know uh yeah they... uh, dog or, or um two hearted ale uh from uh from bells i think is at least seven percent and that's just yeah. you know an ipa uh i think founders centennial is like seven and a half so knowing those modern standards, if we're if we're wanting to create a you know a malt liquor with a high ABV, uh, you know as the standard implies, how high should we go? What was on your on your little scale? What was the the range? 
<laughs> I don't think we we need to. I think it's it, it's it's based on the um, um, uh, the um, oh what's what's Ray Daniels uh, Cicerone the the Cicerone uh, cards that uh, that Adam Ross has, hmm. um, and so I you know seven seven percent might you know might fit in there. Sure. Uh, so should we just should, should we say that should we? I mean, it's a, it would very high ABV it would definitely be like nine, something like that. Right. So is seven enough? Seven percent enough for for a malt yeah, liquor? That's a strong beer. Okay. All right. Uh, well, let's 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 go there. I'm, I plan on brewing a five gallon batch of this and and kegging it. So you know, okay. for for self preservation, maybe seven percent would be <laughs> for the, yeah for the rest of my summer. Um, and also seven percent a fermentation at seven percent isn't that hard to do. Whereas the the higher you get, the more you know temperature control and 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 you know things you need to worry about. Yeah. I've, Seven's I've, easily doable. I think I'm I'm near the near the bottom of the uh, the kegs that are in my kegerator, so I'm, I may clear clear that out and and clear my kegerator to be a fermentation chamber. Um, so let before we go down the road too much, let's talk about fermentables. Um, mm-hmm. uh, this is a, an American malt liquor, so I'm assuming we're talking adjuncts. We could, but was also wasn't your your target. Color gold. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I mean, an American malt liquor would be more of like a straw color. Okay. Like so, we could go, we could decrease the amount of adjuncts and even add some Vienna malt to get a nice gold color. Ooh. Uh, you know, and, and flavor, which would then also help balance the uh, the added bitterness. Okay, I like that. Yeah, just for your information, the choices on color are pale, gold. Amber, brown, and black. Okay. So, so gold is a, obviously a step up from a notch up from pale. pale. Yeah. 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 Okay. I like that. You got your spreadsheet. Mm-hmm. There's also, and you're going to be brewing this, so this is totally up to you. There's, there's a way to do this that would be different. Uh, <laughs> I'm not known for brewing different things. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Well, one thing you could you could get a beer with a nice gold color and strong uh, by reiterated mashing. Have I ever? Oh. I've done a show about reiterated mashing, haven't I? Yeah. You mash once. <laughs> okay. I heard that too. Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> you, you make you make you make a wort, and then you make a you make another mash, and you put, yeah. use that that first wort as the brewing water. Right. Uh, yeah. But for seven, you know, for seven percent, that's kind of overkill. Yeah, and it's summertime. It's hot outside. <laughs> I brew outside. <laughs> so thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can do it. Yeah, I mean, it's easy. You know, I got a, a f- fifteen and a half gallon, you know, a kettle. Uh, so brewing a five gallon bat. You know, I, I just brewed that. You know, my double IPA with you know fifteen pounds of grain. Uh, with no problem in that in that space, so I think we'll we'll have no problem uh, with with the grain in this one. We don't need to do any you know fancy reiterated reiterated mashing stuff. I know, I know fancy reiterated. <laughs> don't need no reiterated mashing stuff. So so how so what? Put some numbers out there and put some put some grains out there. What 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 are we going to be brewing with? I'm looking. Right now at something. <laughs> okay, here we go. For five gallons, if we used 12 pounds of Vienna malt and then one and a quarter pound of flaked maize, uh, which is a little less than 10% of the grist, which is still is malt liquor-like, but, but less. You know, they, they use up 30 or 40%. Um, that should, if it, if it ferments out pretty well, which it, which it should, uh, that would give us a ABG right around seven. ABV, sorry. <laughs> I don't know what ABG I, is. Have another swig. Have a, <laughs> fruit beer is good. 
Okay. <laughs> I think I think it'll be a little higher, and well, maybe maybe not though. I, I think, and if we go a little high on the ABV, I, you know, I'm not going to be unhappy. Yeah. If it starts at 65, and ferments down to or like you know 1065, and ferments down to 1011, which is a little more than 75 percent, uh, then that would uh, yeah that would get us in the that would get us right at seven. And, and then any any special uh you know mash techniques or temperatures or characteristics or i would say either just a low temperature uh sacrification rest a uh i shouldn't say sacrification rest after an eight percent beer um just say sugar rest and it's a sugar rest it's all day sweetie yeah don't don't go complicating it up. <laughs> so I was saying, yeah, like, it, like 148 maybe. Yeah, Fahrenheit. 148, 150, anywhere in there uh, for 60 minutes. That would be good. Or you could do a quick step mash, like mash in at about 140, you know, stir it up, and then instantly turn on the burner and start ramping it up to like 152. Oh. Uh, either way. Um, that the second one would be like a pseudo step mash or even let it sit for 15 minutes at 140 and then and then ramp it up that would get you a slightly more fermentable work than just a, a single infusion okay you know i'm gonna take the easy way out but you know <laughs> <laughs> sure <laughs> just just so as you know <laughs> but if, but for those who want to want to be have more effort um, yeah. <clears throat> who knows? Maybe someone's actually listening to this show. <laughs> <laughs> people still do, whether they brew or not. You know, that's the question. But you know, <laughs> people still listen. Uh, so, uh, so, do we want to hops? Do we want to just you know? It's it's it specifies high bitterness, right? Or no, very high bitterness. Uh, so, should we just stick with? You know, a bittering charge at the at the beginning of say a sixty minute boil, and just stick with that. Or do we want to add some hop, hop character at the end? Or I would say for uh, if we're sort of trying to be a sort of kind of trying to be a U.S. malt liquor, because that was in the specifications, right? U.S. origin, right? Uh, I would pick to something like Magnum, some very high alpha hop, yeah, and, and add it at the beginning of the boil. Okay. And what what kind of IBUs are we shooting for? Well, for I'm, very high. I mean, if you're talking if you're talking an original gravity of 1065, you know, if you if you use the BU to BU GU ratio, GU yeah. ratio uh I mean, should we do like 1 to 1 or uh That's, that, that sounds like a pretty good idea. Like 65 IBUs? Yeah. Let's shoot for that. Okay. What's your what's your numbers? What's your numbers say? My, my newfangled number machine here. <laughs> um. Yeah. Let's see. Hmm. Okay. If you use sixteen alpha acid hops, like something like Magnum, uh, one and a quarter ounce. Well, that brings us to seventy five. Mm. Hang on. Hang on a tick. Let me add it just a little bit, and it seemed to. Uh, okay. There's a well. It's high off the hump, so of course there's a steep. What if what if there's it's more like a nine, uh, nine percent alpha acid? Okay, let's try that. I mean, it seems to be a little more flexible. Right. Well, what I finally came up with is if you added one point one ounces or thirty one grams at sixteen, that that got. <laughs> So and we'll try to nine and see what we get. Then I would just be adding one package and calling it good. <laughs> hey, here you go. Two ounces on the nose of 9% gets us to 67. Oh. So perfect. So two ounces at 9%. And then and then no no hops on the on the back end, probably. Yeah, I would just let the let yeah. the bitterness. Yeah, and use a you know, at nine, something with a Without a lot of vegetal or not vegetal, uh, varietal character. Right. Oh, okay. I may have some more of this beer. <laughs> it's, gro- well, it's, the, it's growing on me, actually. I, I think know. it's, yeah. I think it's pretty. <laughs> I think it's pretty good. 
Seriously, I think as it, as it warms up, I think it's I think the you know the chocolate notes are coming, the fruits uh, coming out a little bit more. It's getting better. Hmm. It, it. I just wish it had more carbonation, but you know, the it, chocolate is definitely starting to. Yeah. Being more noticeable. And the vanilla is, is fading. Maybe it's because, uh, you know, my tongue's wearing out or maybe it's because it's about, surely it's not because it's evaporating, but um, yeah, it's not bad. I'm, I'm not unhappy with that. So ye- uh, yeast, uh, I will probably <clears throat> get whatever uh, imperial lager yeast is available. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it seems like to me lager yeast is less... You know, people are going to yell at me or whatever, but it seems to me that lager yeast is less um, – you can be less finicky about lager yeast than, than, say, ale yeast or especially like Belgian yeast or whatever. Uh, yeah, the difference the differences between the different lager strains are, are smaller than the differences between ale strains typically. You know, ale strains range from the, you know, just insanely estery, fruity – to clean to you know the Belgian ones with the phenolics, yeah. And, uh, lager yeast are, you know, they have different characteristics, but yeah. And for this beer, like we're not trying to clone anything, mm-hmm. so whatever character we get, we'll just take a note of it. And if we brew it again, or if you brew it again, we'll make changes as needed. And I'll probably, since I'm going to be pitching and fermenting at, at around, like, what, 55 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, I'll probably will make a starter. I'll dust off my stir plate mm-hmm. and, and make, like, a two-liter starter uh, with the imperial yeast. Um, it may be overkill, but, you know, what the heck. Um, well, for a, for a 7% lager, yeah, I wouldn't say that's overkill. I'd say that's something that's going to really help you get a good... Uh, ordered fermentation out of the deal. Yeah, and again, we're not wanting any yeast character at all. So, probably right. make make the starter a couple of days ahead of time, let it finish out, uh, put it in the fridge, you know, let the let the yeast settle all the way down, you know, and then pour off the beer before you know swir- yep. swirling up the yeast cake and then pouring it into the the fermenter, you know, just standard standard practice, and then paying attention to the fermentation. And as it slows down, bring it out to room temperature to do a diacetyl rest. And, yep, and that would be good. There we go. There we have it. So pretty simple. I like your I like your approach of using the Vienna malt to give it a little color and a little character. Uh, I was thinking just more, you know, like almost fifty fifty, like Pilsner and rice. <laughs> yeah, well, that would have made a very straw colored. Yeah, and still probably would have been. You know, good, but if if our target is gold, yeah, there's a way to get to gold. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that uh, it's going to be a much more interesting beer uh, to drink, um, and a prettier beer, and it won't just be, you know, just a kind of a novelty, you know, big old, you know, yellow, fizzy yellow beer. <laughs> It'll be something that tastes like something. Um, so good. Would that, would that beer, would this recipe fit into any other established category? You know, I don't know. I'm not the guy to ask about <laughs> styles. <laughs> so I would have to care and I don't want to. I, I would say you could probably sneak it in under like an IPL, mm. you know. It's not hoppy enough though. It's it's not going to have enough hop character enough though for, for that. Sure. Um, It'll just be better, but yeah, it's, it's all right. Yay! I think it's going to be good. And I'll I'll send you some. Good. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for for being my guinea pig on the fruit beer. Um, I you know I just I honestly didn't know how it was going to turn out, uh, but there were just those parameters that I wanted to to uh, test to see if it actually mm-hmm. you know would 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 do the things that I wondered if it would do. And that is, you know, stop the fermentation and preserve fruit character. Um, we just need to figure out a way to, to monitor the, um, you know, monitor the, the carbonation level a, a bit better than just squeeze in the, squeeze in the bottle. <laughs> so, so that this is the first step down the road. 
And if any, anybody out there, you know, takes this the next step uh, and has, uh, you know, any successes or failures, we'd love to hear about those too, just, not just at the end of the year, uh, but uh, let, it, let us know. And I just now figured out what the name of my malt liquor is in my book. I went to look it up and like I made up the name and then reading it, I was like, what the hell is that? Because <laughs> the name is land like O with O apostrophe calories Ian. Lando. And I'm like what? Lando Calrissian. <laughs> okay. Right. They they can't all be winners. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my god. <laughs> oh, I'll await the knock from uh, Lucas Films. <laughs> Mr. Colbert, we have a cease and desist order. <laughs> so so why did why did uh <laughs> Why did you choose that? Uh, was the uh, was, a was random the, Star Trek or Star Wars reference? Was the beer to be frozen and to lager and in carbonite? Yeah. Carbonite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, yeah, there might have been a higher minded thing, but I think it's just a random Star Wars reference. When I, I always I always think that uh, that Han Solo was frozen in carbonite, uh, but that's a whole nother thing, and that has to do with Tranya. And I hope you relish it as much as I. So mm. that's for the that's for the the maybe the one original series Star Trek nerd that's out there listening to this. I'm talking to you, Desiree. You know, mm. <laughs> Desiree knows. <laughs> Was that the episode the the carbonite maneuver? Or the corbum, like that? corbamite maneuver. Corba, corbamite with, maneuver. with Clint Howard. Look, I know something about Star Trek too. <laughs> <laughs> We call it Tranya. I hope you relish it as much as I. This beer is making me smarter. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Time to shut off the microphones before we get too smart for our own good. <laughs> this is why I don't do live shows. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, James. Many thanks to Chris. I've got lots of yeast from the the uh, this sequence of starters that I made uh, that will go into this beer. Really looking forward to brewing it this weekend. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, we're to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basic brewing. It's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dots. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voice. Talk to you next time, everybody. In the meantime, stay well and stay tuned. So long. <laughs>